All right. Who here has had their life touched by divorce, either yours personally or your parents or a friend or a family? It's, it's kind of been, all right. That's almost every single hand in the room has gone up saying, yep, my life's felt it. I've experienced it. It's hit my family. It's affected my life. And uh, it's true that the divorce rates are, in fact, going down. Um, for a long time, we've heard 50% of all marriages end in divorce, and that was taken by the number of marriages in a year. Ooh, and boom, and where's Chuck in the, give me some help, my man. So the marriages in a given year, and then they would take the divorces in a given year, and then they would say, well, there's this many million marriages and 500,000 divorces, half of the marriages are ending in divorce. Of course, that didn't take into account that any given year, there was way more married people to fit in this category, so they weren't sure. But... It's definitely going down. Uh, last in 2014, there were 2,140,000 plus marriages and 813,000 divorces. So it's starting to decline in the 40%, maybe one third. So we saw this huge leap in America in the 1970s, particularly, and into the early 80s when divorce was a major factor on the American society frontier of what was happening. And partly that's because the message had gone out in the late 60s and early 70s by counselors and psychologists and media people that uh, basically, if you're not happy, get out. You need to be happy, and your happiness is the most important thing, and your children who are in a marriage watching you and your spouse fight is worse for the children, so if you split, it'll be better off for the children. And that message went out. It was embraced. We created no-fault divorce and uh, ended up with a lot more marriages falling apart and then about a decade later, all the stats started to come in on the children who were going to be better off because their parents split. And you know what the stats have said. Absolutely not. In fact, the statistics over and over, and I could read them for you, but I'll just summarize, would be that most likely to end up in jail, more likely to use drugs, more likely to have suicide, have psychological problems, can't get along with their peers, four times more likely to get divorced themselves. On and on the stats would go that well, to live in poverty, more likely to live in poverty, on and on, that children of divorced parents actually ended up psychologically and socially devastated way more than had their parents just stayed together. And uh, so that began this journey back a little bit with psychologists and people saying, well, wait a minute, maybe we've got this wrong. Maybe we needed to retool this. And people had tried doing their marriages, and typically that marriages that fell apart in a first or second marriage, and now third marriages are going on. The breakup in an average rate right now in America is about 40%. It's falling in there. If you're on a second or third marriage or a second marriage, it's 60 to 70, 67% chance that you will lose that second marriage. And if you're on your third marriage, 73 to 74% chance that marriage will fail. So everybody's like, well, I got it wrong the first time. I'll get it right the second time or the third time actually is showing over and over. Look, you never got it right the first time and you're just repeating the mistakes that you won't learn from. That's what the stats are saying. And we've all looking around here. We've all been touched somehow by divorce. I wish I could say it was different in the church, but the truth of the matter is when they take the stats of society and they say, what's it like out there in the big wide Americana landscape? And then they get the stats of how many divorces there are and whatnot. And then they go inside the church and they say, what about inside the church? It should be different, right? And then guess what? It's not. It's the same inside the church as outside. So it's something that has torn us apart. And it's been kind of a problem issue for a lot of us for a long time. We've been hearing about you know, Christians sort of taking a stand on marriage and family and this, uh, this sort of thing. But yet you don't hear a lot of churches standing up regarding the issue of broken families and divorce. And I think a lot of it is because it's too late. It's too late. Look at us. We're in the room asking how many of you have immediately been affected by divorce. And virtually every hand in the room went up. And so it's a difficult subject for me to tackle, and I felt like first service, I just lumbered through this like I was slugging through mud, but I'm going to try to do a little bit better this time. Uh, so I'm, it's just weird because I feel a spiritual heaviness on it. But I have to speak on it because today, as we preach through the Gospel of Mark, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, you do kind of a deal with it. If you do a Gospel like that, you're going to deal with all the stuff Jesus talked about. And so rather than skip over and only talk about the stuff I like that Jesus said, occasionally I have to preach on stuff I don't like what Jesus said, but Jesus said it, so let's look at it. And today, that's what we're dealing with, divorce. Jesus talked about it, so let's look at it. And uh, let's see what he had to say. So before we dig into Mark chapter 10, oh, I just need to pray. Lord Jesus, I need your spirit to fall. It just felt so heavy for a service. and not intending. There's, I mean, there's hope here. There's a 
incredible message of hope, but also, Lord, when you speak hard and clear, sometimes you challenge us about things that we have embraced and no longer, no longer fought for. And we've just sort of rolled over and allowed life to happen the way it has, allowed values to become what they are, allowed the society to make shape us instead of allowing you and your power and your word to shape us. And so today, Lord, I ask that your spirit fill this room with your grace and your mercy. Lord, both challenge us and renew us. And where we are wrong, forgive us. As we open your word to explore this, Lord, open our hearts and our minds to hear you clearly, in spite of our prejudices and our preconceived notions. This I pray in your holy name, King of kings and Lord of lords, God most high. Amen. All right, Mark chapter 10. Let's take a look at what Jesus has to say. And it's kind of funny because even in this passage, Jesus doesn't bring it up. Other people bring it up. The religious people bring it up for crying out loud. He just answers it. All right, so here's what he says. Chapter 10, verse 1, Mark. If you're using one of these blue and white Bibles provided on your table, it's going to be page 690. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. And some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Well, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Okay, let's stop right there. All right, so Jesus is up in Galilee. It's about 70, 80 miles north of Jerusalem. That's mainly where he is, where he does his preaching and does his talking. And every now and then in his ministry, he would wander down near the Jerusalem area where all the hardcore religious people were. And the religious people, he kind of stayed mostly away from them, but he goes down every now and then and sort of rocks the boat there a little bit. In this case, he's gone down near Jerusalem. He's crossed over the Jordan on the east side, so he's kind of not in their turf, but he's close enough. Close enough that a group of Pharisees, which are the high-ranking, legalistic, moralistic, nose-in-the-air snobs, come across the river to hear him, and they're going to challenge him. And we see right here in the text, they weren't asking him a question for information. They weren't saying, hey, what, what do you really believe here, Jesus? They, in fact, were asking him to test him. What had happened is Herod, King Herod had basically dumped his wife and his, took his brother's ex-wife, brought her into his palace, was having her be the queen, and John the Baptist spoke against He says, this is unlawful, it's not from God, you're violating scriptures, you're the king of the uh, Jewish people, you're supposed to be holy and righteous, you're supposed to be following God's way. John the Baptist preached against that divorce that he had done, and it got John the Baptist thrown in prison, and eventually the ex-wife had him beheaded. So what these Pharisees are doing is they're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to say, whatever he answers, we got him. If he says, yes, it's fine to divorce, we got some scriptures we're going to go after him with. And if he says, no, we're going to go to Herod and say, hey, you've got another John the Baptist on your hands, you better lock him up. So that's really what they're doing. They're not seeking Jesus' answer. But since they ask Jesus the question, what do you think about divorce, Jesus? I look at our day and age and I say, wouldn't we actually want to know that answer in our age and our time in our society? Wouldn't that be a good answer for us? And so Jesus responds to them and he says, okay, What's in the law of Moses? Because that's what the Pharisees are following. They're going to follow the Old Testament law, and they're going to go by it word for word, exactly what it says. They're going to do their best to uphold it. So he says, well, what does it say in the law? And their response is, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Let's look at that place in the law where it says that. It's Deuteronomy chapter 24. Go back in your Bibles, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 24, and this is the place in the Bible where in the Old Testament, the allowance for divorce was written in there. And Moses is the one writing the law, but he's doing it under the power of God. So the understanding is, yes, this is Moses writing the law, but these are the words of God for our society. So God's setting up the rules through Moses. So in other words, though Moses said it, it's coming from God. And it says this, chapter 24, verse 1. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house and becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce and gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. There it is. An interesting passage because you notice it doesn't actually say, God is saying, write a certificate of divorce. You notice it doesn't actually say that. 
What it says is, if a man writes a certificate of divorce. So when these guys ask Jesus, is it permissible to divorce your wife? His response is, well, what does Moses say? And they refer to a passage, well, Moses said, it's okay. But when you read the passage, it's like, well, that's not exactly what he says. He says, if you do this, here's the consequences. And so what had happened through the time, Moses is about 1,500 years before Jesus. What had happened through those 1,500 years is rabbis began to ask certain questions like, what does it mean displeasing? What does it mean if he finds something displeasing about her? What does it mean if he finds something indecent about her? And the indecent, the, the Hebrew word there is a sexual connotation to it. And so there's, they're like, well, what does it mean? Does that mean adultery? What does that mean? So the Jewish people began asking each other, on what grounds can a man write a certificate of divorce for his wife? And so there was two schools of thought in Jesus' time. Rabbi Shammai had this view, only for adultery. That's it. If it's not been adultery, you can't write a certificate of divorce. Now it's his, basically a hardcore, a heavy view of the sanctity of marriage. Rabbi Hillel taught a little differently. He said, no, no, displeasing and indecent have different views. And he had a more liberal view, and he find, defined it more loosely. The actual Hebrew says, if she is, uh, finds no favor in his eyes, that's it. If she finds no favor in his eyes, he can write her certificate of divorce. So they asked, well, what does that actually mean? So by the time Rabbi Hillel comes along, it meant, well, if she burnt his dinner, he could write her certificate of divorce. If she talked to a strange man, she could write a, he could write a certificate of divorce. If she was a brawler, which meant in an argument, if her voice could be heard outside the house, you could write her certificate of divorce. It said, if uh, she spoke disrespectfully of her husband's family, you could get a divorce. Uh, the successors to Hillel, his like, group that was behind him after he had died and passed on, they sort of picked up and championed. And they went even further and said, if he no longer finds her attractive, he can write her a certificate of divorce. Originally, this whole thing in, in uh, Deuteronomy was sort of meant to be a restriction, but it had sort of gotten blown out of proportion. So in Jesus' time, which rabbi do you think was dominating the culture? Shammai's view or Hillel's view? Which one do you think was the most popular? Hillel, of course, Hillel's was, right? Oh, just get rid of her. She's no good, that sort of thing, right? I want something different. So this was the dominant thinking in Jesus' time. And uh, interesting to note, women did not have their same rights. Women could not divorce their husbands um, under the same rules. So uh, ancient societies through time, it's always been the curse of women to have to battle and fight for their position in pretty much all societies. And so women's rules in those days was this. She could only divorce her husband if they'd been married 10 years with no children. That gave her right to divorce him. If he became a leper, she could divorce him. If he took up a disgusting trade like being a tanner, where he was always dealing with skinning out animals and blood and guts and all that kind of thing and stunk and dealing with dead bodies, made him ritually unclean, she could divorce him. Or if he falsely accused her of infidelity, she could divorce him. Those are the only terms a woman could divorce by. So you got to understand when Jesus is talking, who is he probably mostly talking to? He's talking to the men, right? He's, he's talking to men. So it's interesting. As he begins saying this stuff, he says, okay, here's what it comes down to. Um, I'll, I'll go this far. E even in modern society, these are still kind of the two camps inside Christianity. When you start talking about divorce, they tend to be like really rigid or really loose. And everybody's trying to negotiate their way between the rigid and the loose and trying to find it. We're all trying to discover Jesus' answer for us, right? So in modern times, the sacramental view would be over here in the Shamiite camp, right? The sacramental view is that when you get married, that you enter into a spiritual, mystical union that God unites your souls and spirits together. And the pledge of marriage and the vows of marriage, the till death do us part vows you make, in the church, before God, actually God takes the souls of those two people and he knits them and twines them together in a, what's called an ontological union. And that can never be broken. So even if the two people later on hate each other's guts and leave each other and don't live with each other anymore, that spiritual union is still intact. This is the Catholic sacramental view of marriage. It's why no divorce in a Catholic church. Because they say, even if you separate and go your separate ways, God has done something that you can't undo. And so as a consequence, many churches that hold this view would be divorced people, therefore cannot be leaders in the church, could never be pastors, can't be on board members, those kinds of things. This view is, has such a holy, sacred kind of approach to it as a spiritual issue 
that they would say, you have actually forfeited your rights to be a leader in a church. And that permeates, even today, there are many uh, Protestant churches which would not exactly hold the spiritual union piece, but definitely hold if you've divorced, you have forfeited your rights to ever be a leader in a church. Can't lead a Bible study, can't be on a board, can't be a pastor. That's a common view in churches today. The other view is kind of falls on the other side is more of a social view. And that view is that, well, divorce is super common and we need to just adjust to it and get over it and deal with it and get on in life. And that marriage is more of a societal, social contract between two people. And sometimes the contract works and sometimes it needs to be broken. And when it's broken, we just have to do our best to, to figure out how to move on. That the needs and the happiness of an individual take precedence over everything and God wants you to be happy God's pleased with your life if you're happy and fulfilled. And if that marriage is destructive to your soul and spirit, you need to get out of it and set yourself free. And God, if it's a sin, God can forgive it and you'll all be okay. And within Christianity, these tend to be the two extremes you will hear about and deal with. And all of us are trying to find our way in the midst of this. And all of us are wondering, who's right? And the answer isn't really who's right. The answer really is, what do you say about it, Jesus? That's really the answer. And so when we get back to Mark chapter 10, we get Jesus about to give his answer. And I think, you know, all of us have been there and stuck with it. And, and everybody, when you start talking about divorce, here's what's frustrating and wonderful at the same time. When you start talking about divorce, everybody filters this topic through their own personal experience with it. Everybody does. So everybody says, immediate thing is, well, what about, and then you're going to finish the sentence with whatever's happened in your life, whether it was your parents or yourself personally or your brother or sister or your uncle or your best friend. Everybody filters this topic through the pain, the hurt, the frustrating, the anger of what has happened in their life. And all of that pain and all of that anger and all of that trauma and all of that uh, suffering sort of boils to the surface and it makes it hard for us to hear God clearly. And so I acknowledge that. I know it's there. I have it in my own life with experiences. So I'm, I'm wrestling with this too, but I'm still wanting to know, what do you have to say about it, Jesus? What do you really say? And in Mark chapter 10, Jesus gives his answer. And he responds first with the, um, he, he sort of responds first to the, uh, hang on a second, I want to sort something out in my mind here. He responds first to those who have probably this sacramental view. He goes with, when they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Jesus says this, it was because of your hardness of your heart's that Moses wrote you this law. Jesus replied, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When Jesus first answers, it sounds like he's saying, this camp is right over here, this strong view, right? Because what he says is, what does Moses say? And they're like, well, Moses said it was going to be okay because there's a, there's a clause in Deuteronomy 24 about getting a, a divorce. And Jesus says, okay, I'll tell you why that's in the law. The reason that's placed in the law and the reason God put that in there is because the hardness of the hearts of human beings had gotten so bad, their inability to function with each other, their inability to love each other, their inability to stay together in a union, their inability to fix things, their inability to deal with their sin issues, their selfishness, their corruption had become so hard in their heart that God allowed a compromise and said, okay, I understand it can get so bad at some point it can't be rescued. There's a clause saying you can divorce under those circumstances. However, Jesus is saying, you need to know that's the compromise made with man and man's hard heart. That is not the way God initially set it up. What he says is, he goes back to the very beginning. He says, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female and placed them together in union. He's saying marriage is actually not a government institution. Marriage is not a man-made thing that we decide what to do with. The idea of marriage did not come out of government. It came out of God's own heart and mind, and it was set in the very beginning of creation. And he made them this way and set up the way. And God's intent was it be fulfilled for a lifetime. And because of sin and corruption, it failed. And God wrote the escape clause in Deuteronomy, if we want to call it that. And it's interesting because when he starts talking about this, uh, there's other places where, he, where it's referred to. We're just actually going to look at maybe the other two major passages where the concept of divorce is dealt with in the scriptures. One is in Malachi chapter 2. 
And it's the book right before Matthew. So we're in Mark, go to Matthew, keep going backwards. The very last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. And the concept of divorce is there as well. And in Malachi, it was, gee, he's 500 years before Jesus, so it's been 1,000 years since Moses. And he's writing at the very end of their time before the Babylonians would come and destroy them and wipe them out. So he's sort of writing at that season when they were extremely corrupt, extremely wicked, extremely far gone. And God speaks through his prophet Malachi to warn the people. So it's really interesting when Malachi writes, he's writing as if it's God himself speaking because it is. It's the Holy Spirit going, boof, taking him over and speaking through him. And he talks about divorce in chapter 2, verse 19, uh, page, what is that, 653. And I'm going to look at verse 13 of chapter 2. Another thing you do, this is God speaking to Malachi, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and you wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. And you ask why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So keep in mind, the laws had been, the men had the freedom to get a divorce, right? Not the women. So what had happened by Malachi's time is like guys were doing what modern American uh, mindset is, is, well, I just trade my old wife in on a new model when I reach about 50 years old. Oh, the kids are gone. They're out of the house. I got my career going. I don't want her anymore. I want something young and fresh, and I'm going to buy a new sports car to go with her, right? And that's what had happened here. And God is saying, you do that, and then you come into my house, and you cry with weep and wailing why I won't answer your prayers. He's saying, I'm not going to answer your prayers because you have been unfaithful to the wife of your youth. You have done something wrong. And what's really interesting, I don't think the NIV catches it. It says, the man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel. That's a really difficult Hebrew phrase to to figure out and parse and unpack. And I think the NIV got it wrong, actually. If you look at other translations like the New American Standard and others, the actual wording there, because it says basically because hate divorce is the way it would literally translate the English. And so like I said, what exactly does that mean? I think the New American Standard got it right where it says, God is saying, I hate divorce. I hate divorce. For hatred, there's divorce. God is saying it's something he hates. And if you actually look in a New American Standard and a Revised Standard, other translations, some of you probably got those here. That's what God is saying. And there's not many things in Scripture that you can find that God specifically says he hates. Very few things. And so this is the thing where God's saying, I hate divorce. And so that's a major passage to deal with. And then the last one is going to be First, or first Corinthians chapter 7. Because what ends up happening is everybody keeps asking, well, well, what about my situation? What about what's going on with me? What about my Christian life? I've been asking God to help and he's not. And this old person I'm married to is destroying me and killing me and this whole thing. And so God is, has to speak through Paul to the Corinthian church about what's going on with them. What had been going on with them is a bunch of people were coming to Jesus. And as these pagans were crossing over and becoming Christians, they were trying to deal with adjusting to their new Christian life with their old pagan spouse. And so Paul has to write them in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12. He says, to the rest, I say this. And he says, I, uh, well, actually, I'm going to back up to verse 10. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. What he means when he says, not I, but the Lord, he's saying this. I'm telling you what has already been recorded and everybody knows Jesus explicitly said. It's not my command, it's Jesus' command. So that's what he's saying. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. The Lord's the one giving the command. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. And most of us read that and go, well, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, what we're really saying is, I know what it means, I just don't like what it says. That's what we're really asking. But then he goes on and he says this interesting thing. To the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. Meaning, these are issues Jesus did not explicitly teach on. But the Holy Spirit had filled the leaders of the church and were speaking through the leaders of the church. And at the time the Apostle Paul is writing this, the Holy Spirit is on him and he's writing scripture because we'll know through other studies that all scripture is God breathed. God is breathing this. So these are actually still the words of God. To the rest, I say this, I not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. 
And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So here's what happens in Christian circles. We know what Jesus said. And actually, in that Mark passage we read, the exact same passage is listed in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew tells the story, too, of what Jesus said. And in Matthew 19, there's there's another phrase that Jesus used that Mark didn't record. And he says, Basically, you cannot get a divorce except for the cause of unchastity, infidelity. Okay, so that's in the Matthew 19. You can look it up if you want to. In the Matthew 19 passage, Jesus gave the adultery is a, is a get-out-of-jail-free card for your marriage if you hate it. But other than adultery, it's like, well, what other reasons could someone get a divorce? Because when we read Jesus, he's saying, nope. And in 1 Corinthians, you have this, well, what does it mean if the unbeliever leaves? What, what does this mean? And so we would sit around in my seminary classes when I was years ago and debating this whole thing. It, 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 what kind of reasons would someone be allowed to leave for? In other words, if someone abandons the marriage, you are not bound. Let them leave. And then the questions could arise. We're arising. Is it possible that someone abandons the marriage and for all intents and purposes leaves the marriage, but actually doesn't pack a bag and get out of the house? Is that possible? Do we have people who basically through their gambling or drug addiction or through their violence, or, or through their abuse. They have abandoned all the principles, the godly principles of marriage, what God means a marriage to be, what God intends a husband and wife to act like. They've abandoned it. They've thrown it aside. They're trampling it under feet. They're acting completely like an unbeliever who has abandoned this marriage. Is the person free to leave? That becomes an interesting question. And we would debate it. We would kick it around. And I remember one seminary class I was in, a bunch of super conservative Baptist guys were like, yes, under certain circumstances, and we would kick this around. But the whole room was pretty much like saying, but she can't remarry, or he can't remarry if they leave. And then we had the whole discussion. It's like, no, 1 Corinthians says, if they leave, you are not bound. So if you're not free to remarry, then it would mean technically you are still bound to the old marriage, right? And so we would have these debates going on too. And so whenever you talk to people who are on the verge of divorce, or who have been divorced, or thinking about divorce, who've suffered it years ago, everybody says they kind of want to know, what about me and my case, right? That's, what we're, that's kind of where it all comes down to. And when it all comes down to that, it's like, listen, you have to hear from Jesus. You have to ask Jesus what you're supposed to do because you are not ever going to stand in front of a, any pastor anywhere and have to give an account for your life. You are going to have to stand before Jesus and give an account for your life. And some people are like, well, what if I've sinned? What if it's been a sin? I would say, look, Scripture only lists one unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Typically what happens is as people reflect on divorce, I think it comes down to this. I think that in truth, a whole bunch of things I think, and from here I'm going to start just sort of seeing what God says. Some of what I say is from God today, some it's not. I don't know which is which. And you will have to figure out in your own life what what it matters. So where was I? Uh, The whole, the whole, where was I? I was, I was going to say something really smart there and... uh, (laughs) So people ask us, sort of, what about, okay, here's what I've known. I have talked now with hundreds of people, hundreds of people who've been divorced, remarried, happily remarried, God's using them in their life. And many of them will say, even years after the fact, they will say, I could have saved that first marriage. I could have. Now that I know what I know, now that I've come through the fire and I've been burned, I realize I didn't do enough to try to salvage that marriage. And there's sort of this sense where God's worked through them, brought them to a new place of peace and even joy and life and happiness and productivity. But they can reflect back and say, now that I know what I know, it it didn't work out well. I could have been better. I didn't pay any of the sacrifices in my first marriage that I was willing to pay in my second marriage. In the second marriage, I got it right. I had a friend, um, his name was Don Partridge. He went and got his doctorate at Oxford University in blended families in the church because nobody was writing books about this in the 1990s. Everybody was quoting the stats saying, gee, 40% of the church is divorced. And nobody would write a book about, well, what's it like to have a blended family then in the church? Who's writing on that? Nobody. So he gets his doctorate from Oxford University. And I sit Don down one day and we're chit-chatting. I say, what have you learned, man? You've been six years of studying with a PhD. And he goes, here's what I've learned. 
it never, whenever, two, whenever the second marriage happens, it's rarely the husband and wife who blow the marriage up. It's almost always the kids. And I say, how come? What, what's going on there? He goes, well, typically the adult couple tries to act like they're single and that there's nobody else in the, in the equation. And so they just get married and they sort of drag these kids into it. And then they don't realize how much power the kids have to fight it. And then he said, the kids, here's what I've learned. The kids will always go biological. If dad is a no good, lay around, sleep around drunk, the kids will always side with him over stepdad. Same thing with mom. They will always go with biological mom over stepmom. And that fight and that battle and that thing that happens, even if you could deal with the people later, he says it's, it's, it's unbelievable how much the kids will blow the marriage up. And oftentimes the second marriage, why you see it's so much higher, 60 to 70% in second and third marriages, it's because this extended family who has all this anger and all this hurt and all these emotional wounds are blowing up the second marriage. And he said, that's been shit. So you're going to kind of work with sort of coming up with curriculum to battle that. And that was kind of his goal, his plan at the time. I know that uh, when, we, when we sit and look in a room like this, right here, right now, there's four kinds of people sitting in the room. You're happily married, never been divorced, you know, got the first spouse you've had, you're on it. Or, you know, you feel like, well, you know, I'm a, I was a widower or a widow and I've remarried. I've kind of, none of this kind of fits to me. I haven't experienced it. Um, you're happily married. A- another group of people are those of you who are married unhappily. You're sitting here in this room right now and you're like, I'm unhappily married to the person I'm with. And I wish I could get out and I want to get out. And I'm interested to know not what Jesus said about divorce, but what are the escape clauses in the scripture? Those are the really the ones I want to focus on today, right? And then there's those of you who um, are divorced, you are separated, you've been through the ringer, you've been through the fire, maybe more than once. And you're sitting here in the room, it's like, oh, every time we bring this topic up, it's like punching the nose. Sorry, Jesus talked about it, so we are. Not meaning to punch you in the nose, but you're wrestling with a lot of this stuff in your own heart. And then there's those of you who are single, and this hasn't quite touched your life yet. So um, what would I say to each group? To those of you who are happily married, uh, I was at a conference on Wednesday down at Union Gospel Mission. There was about 200 people in the room, uh, most Christian people who were in workers and nonprofits and pastors and worship leaders and that kind of thing. And over the course of this whole day, there was a lot of praying about what, what's wrong. If we could fix one problem in Spokane, what would it be? If there's one thing that as a united church we could do collectively with all of our resources and talents and whatnot, let's, let's go after the one thing. And it emerged, and it's kind of interesting because they broke us into different tables and said, kind of deal with your one thing. And all the tables but one came up with the same issue. The issue was fix broken families, particularly the loss of fathers. They all said the same thing. So then there became this huge dialogue about it. What was really cool is there's some young guys around 30 years old. Caleb Altmeyer is one who's preached here. and um, Caleb Fisher, who pastors City Church down the block, was another one. And they came and they had them kind of talk about the fact that they sort of stood there and said, listen, our generation, we and our millennials, we haven't seen it. We haven't seen great marriages. All of our friends have, have seen divorce. All of us have been affected by it. All of us are wondering and we're crying and we're wondering, who's going to mentor us? So you think fathers is the problem. Who's going to teach me to be the father that I never had because my dad abandoned me when I was five? Who's going to be there for that? And so the dialogue was fascinating to listen to. What they were saying is, and Caleb Altmeyer works with street kids. He works with street kids. That's who he's got in his ministry out in Hilliard. And his whole thing was, He was kind of saying, I'll get 20 or 30 of these young men around. You know what they're crying for? They're crying for a godly man, somewhere to step into their life and just hang out with them. They want to watch him and study him and see how they act and see what they do. That's what's going on. They're just looking for that godly guy. And so an interesting thing began to unfold, and it's mirrored here. What would I say to those of you who are in good, healthy marriages? It's like, you know, we need you. The church needs you. The church needs your mentoring, it needs your discipling, it needs your wisdom. We need to know how it is you have survived so long in your marriage. What made it work? We need to know how you resolve conflicts. It needs to be role modeled because there's generations now of people who have not seen it. They've not experienced it. And you're needed. Your wisdom is needed. You need to take younger people under your wing and hang out with them. And they're crying for it. Sometimes newlyweds just need to hear that their newlywed struggles are normal. When I first got married to Tanya, it was really, I got married to Tanya when I was 32 years old. So I made a long way through the single life before I got married, right? So it was really interesting. When I first got married to Tanya, I'd pull some of the guys aside who are in the worship team with me at a church. And I would ask, like, well, what have you learned about marriage? What's the thing? And you know, I asked one guy, he'd been married six months. You know, what's it like? And he's like, you know, sometimes I roll over in my bed at night 
and I wonder, who is this stranger in the bed with me? I don't even know this person, right? How did I get into this? What's happened? What happened to her, right? And then six months into my marriage, I would roll over and I'd say, who is this stranger in my bed? And I'd go, oh, this is normal. Okay, I'm all right. I'm doing all right. One guy told me, a good pastor friend of mine, he had been married about three years, and he goes, listen, Rob, I just want you to know this. In the first year of your marriage, all you're doing is learning to fight. I'm like, what? Isn't it all about love and romance and sex? No, you're just learning to fight, he says. He says, what's happening in the first year of marriage is all your, all your issues get escalated really big because you're finally joining your life to someone else, and you think that you know, you've been doing your life a certain way for a long time. There's a rhythm to the way you get up, a rhythm to the way you go to bed, a rhythm to the way you spend your day, and you live, and you think you're going to marry this person who's just going to march right alongside of the rhythms of your life. And it's not going to work that way. They're, not, they're marching to their own rhythms, and all those are going to come into conflict. And so you think, when you first get married, you think, I am not going to live like this for the next 40 years, so I'm going to change you now. And all the fights escalate, right? And so then you learn to boil them down because it's like, this isn't about the next 40 years. It's about right here. And you're going to change, and you're going to adapt, and you're going to be different. And you're going to learn what each other's hot buttons are. You're going to learn what to stay off of, what topics you don't tread on. Because the first year, you're just learning to fight. And after that, you kind of make your way through it, and it's all all right. I think that every single Christian I have ever known, at some point in their life, even great married people, have prayed the prayer, Lord, you gave me the wrong person. I think so. And it's happened. And I would have to confess that in my own life it happened. It was seven years into my marriage with Tanya, wonderful, beautiful woman that she is. I got up one night, got out of bed, and I went to the living room, and I prayed that God would kill her. I did. I said, Lord, our family will have a fighting chance if she's just hit by a bus or something, something quick. So I don't want it to be painful. No, no long, lingering cancer. Just take her out, Lord. Just take her out. And I meant it. And I meant it. And uh, there's a whole long story behind all that. But long story short is that God began to change her. And along with changing her, he changed me. It's funny. We kind of did it in cycles, right? She went through her journey. Then I went through mine. And we're kind of still both going through it together. And my friend Chuck back there, he reminded me of this. He said uh, something I had said to him a year ago kind of rattled in his brain. And I didn't realize how profound it was. He told me after first service, he goes, tell him what you said. I was talking to Chuck about life and marriage, and I said, oh, yeah, the woman I'm with today, you know, 23 years later, is way cooler than the woman I married. Oh, this woman is so much better than the woman I married. I, th- this woman's phenomenal. And kind of rattled him because he talked to a lot of people who just watched their relationships deteriorate. And uh, talking to some friends of his and saying, yeah, I don't know many people who say that anymore who say that the woman I married was okay, now that I look back, she was okay. The woman I have now is phenomenal, right? And so that idea of change and transformation towards something positive is what God wants to do in a great marriage. And he wants those of you with good marriages to pass those insights down, the battles you've been through, the wounds you've had, the stuff you've learned, pass it down. To those of you who are in bad marriages, um, well, if you've been the victim, the victim of adultery in your marriage, by the way, I would say clearly you have an escape clause, and it's just, it's, you have a carte blanche chant from God. He has said specifically, you may leave this marriage, and no, no sin in it at all. You're free to go. You're not bound by that situation. I would say, however, that you still need to ask God, because I have known people who've been through that issue, and God said, save your marriage anyway. And the husband or the wife went back and rebuilt the marriage anyway. So don't ask another person, what does God want me to do? Go ask God that question, because only God can give you that answer. I can tell you what scriptures say, but God has to give you your answer. Because even if scripture says it, God might say something different to you. He might say, well, in your particular case, you don't know what you're going to become. You don't know what he or she is going to become, and I do. So will you trust me to lead you through this? And he may tell you, even though you have the get out of jail free card, don't use it. I don't want you to play. I've known people who've had that case. So if you're in a bad marriage, it could be this. I will say this, though, that you need to figure out how it is you lay your life on an altar of sacrifice. If your marriage is really bad, don't ask so much what's wrong with the other person. Begin asking, what is it I need? Where am I going? And it always astounds me and frustrates me when I talk to couples who are ready to file for divorce and they've never even gone to a marriage counselor, they've never gone to a seminar, they've never read books, they've never done anything to try to salvage their marriage. And they're like, but we're ready to throw it away. To me, that's just stupid. If you are driving your car around and it is making strange knocking noises and you refuse to take it to a mechanic, your car will probably blow up and it will be your fault. 
If your marriage right now is making strange knocking noises and you know something's wrong and you're refusing to take it to a mechanic who would be a marriage counselor or therapist or whatever, then you're stupid. Fix it. Find ways to fix that. You already can feel it all, all those symptoms and pain and suffering. Something I have learned in all of the, my years of dealing with people is <clears throat> I've seen godly, spirit-led men, godly, spirit-filled and led women who have fought to save their marriages and could not while the other person left. And I have learned over the long time of history that it, if both of you are not in the game mutually, you alone cannot save your marriage. The partner has to be with you. But I will say the price to save your marriage is the change in you first, not the change in the other. And so what you have to do is look at yourself and say, what is it, God, that I have done to contribute to the demise of this relationship? I stood in front of you at one point and I said, till death do us part, sickness and in health, hell or high water, I'm with this person. And now here I am. What have I done to destroy my own dream? And examine that and reflect on that. (sighs) Oh, by the way, one caveat. If you are in a violent or abusive situation, get out. Get out. Save yourself. Pack kids. Get out of that place. If it's violent or abusive, do not tolerate it. It may not be that God calls you to divorce the person, but you separate and you get yourself in a healthy place. That's one of the biggest issues that you hear Christians talk about. Is violence and abuse abandoning the marriage in 1 Corinthians? I would say yes. I'm, I would say yes. So definitely get out. Um, for those of you who are divorced or separated, but now, well, divorce, let's go with divorce. You're happily remarried. You're like, yeah, I screwed that up. I got it going now. It's all okay. Um, some of you, and this is possible, I didn't think about this till just now, but some of you are probably, you could be in a divorce situation, um, but you're not remarried, you're not doing it, but you have kids in relationship with that other person. Do everything in your power to try to reconcile it for the sake of those kids. Everything in your power. Because all the stats are in. You've, you've blown your kids up. Their future is in jeopardy. Their emotional health, their psychological, everything is in jeopardy. You've blown them to pieces, right? And if you can reconcile with the other person, do. If you cannot reconcile the marriage with the other person, understand this. You now have an obligation to fight yourself for the sake of those kids, to fix everything you possibly can so that your children don't have to live with the legacy of your mistake. Everything in your power. It's going to hurt you. It's going to cost you. You will pay a price for it. It will inconvenience you. And the answer, I would say, is so what? They didn't ask to have their lives blown up. You blew their lives up. You fixed that. Pay whatever price you have to. Tanya, I have twin daughters. Tanya was never married before uh, when we, she and I met, um, but she had twin daughters. She was a mom living on welfare, single mom living on welfare with twin kids. I met her when the twins were two and a half, maybe three, two and a half, I think. And uh, she'd been with a guy, been living with him. She got pregnant. Long story short, um, you know, that blew their marriage or their relationship up and she separated, but they were never married, so there wasn't any divorce issue. She uh, is living alone in a divey apartment, trying to put herself through school, living on welfare, trying to take care of these kids. Her grandmother, who she barely knew on her mom's side, came and stayed with her one night to help take care of the little babies, and grandma died on the couch that night of a heart attack. Tanya woke up the next morning and said, I think I'll go to church. She's in her mid-20s, never been to church in her life, and decides she's going to start going to church. So she comes to church, and then we would end up getting together and getting married. And early in our marriage, um, she had taken her the father of her children to court and had a court ordered amount of money that he was supposed to pay in child support. And that was creating a huge bond of frustration and anger and irritability and, and all kinds of things between us. And there was a type of thing where when I first met her, we'd pull up to the house and open the door and these little three-year-old girls would leave our car and walk into and disappear into another house. We would never know what was going on. And then we'd come pick them up. Same thing would happen. And she prayed really hard one time and said, I think God wants me to heal this and do whatever I can. I said, well, what is it? And she goes, well, I know the issue and the fam- other family's money. So she went to the house one day and she said, I know what you've been court ordered to pay and I will let you pay anything you want. And he promptly cut his child support payments by about 80%. And it was devastating to us financially, but she felt it was the right thing. And we took that hit. But within a year, we were doing mutual birthday parties together with the kids. And life would unfold from that moment forward to healthy, strong, and vibrant, and uh, it would be good. But it was a hit somebody had to take. And God may be calling you to take a hit to rebuild that family of yours. He may be calling you to pay a price for the sake of the long term of some kids. So if you're divorced or separated, I'd say if you cannot reconcile, take the hit to rebuild your family. Um, if you are um, the one who was wrong in the relationship, repent. Take some time before God and apologize for why you blew your marriage up. God will forgive it. He is gracious. 
He's gracious and just. He will forgive it. And in the forgiveness process also comes, and now that I've forgiven you, we need to change that thing about you that caused that problem in the first place. He'll begin a serious process of change with you, and you've got to submit to it. For those of you who are single, you haven't hit this issue, but it frightens you. I would say, well, first and foremost, and that's why one reason that people are waiting so much longer to get married, people in their 20s, average age for a guy now to get married for the first time is 27 years old. The girl is 23 or 4 now. It used to be no more. Guys were 21. Girls were 18, 19. So it's been changing in our society. And I think it's the fear of it, but also marriages are lasting longer. People want to know what to do. It's very frustrating when you're in your 20s and you're like, I want to build a good marriage, but I've never seen one. I don't know what to do, and I don't know how one even works. But, you know, all of us, that's what we want. And so you're trying to build one. You're single and trying to figure this out. Well, one of the first things that I would say to you is Hollywood is lying to you, right? The idea that I'm going to watch these romantic movies and there's always this one true love I'm meant to be with and all the others are wrong and there's one right person for me and I've got to fall in love with the right person. If I don't, our destinies won't come together and that sort of thing. Uh, yes, not true. You're going to build your married life with whoever you choose and whoever you choose will change who you are. And you're going to be a different person based on who you end up getting married to. So understand, the work of marriage eventually is committed to the commitment, not committed to the person. And you will do that journey. I would say to those of you who are single, choose your spouse very carefully. Very, very carefully. Take at least a year to date. You want to see them in all the seasons. You want to see whether they go berserk at Christmas time when their family has to get together. You want to watch all the seasons of life, what happens, what's their model of life, and how does it roll through the seasons. You want to know them. You want to have experienced every single holiday in the year before you walk, before you choose uh, to marry someone. You want to watch and study everything about them and how they act and how they go on. Be careful with all of that sort of stuff. I would say, um, for those of you who are uh, getting married too, and this is something I need to say to young generation because an older generation already knew this. Uh, I'm hearing this a lot from early 20s people that I've talked to. We just recently encountered it. Hey, it's our life. It's nobody's business. Who cares? Nobody, everybody needs to stay out of our relationship. Me and her, or him and me, this is it. It's only us, and we're the only ones making this decision. It's all about our lives. Leave us alone. I would say if that's your view as a single person, you're a fool. Your life is not just about you. Who you choose to marry affects your mom and dad. It'll affect your brothers and sisters. It'll affect your friendship circles. It's going to affect everybody you know. It isn't just about you. It's a bigger issue than that. And you ought to have the blessing and the people around you who say, I affirm you with that person. You want to people who know you really well agree with you that this is a good choice for you. If you're doing the independent, hey, it's my life, I can do what I want, you have no idea. Really, you're gonna, if you're going to blow your own parents up, you're going to say, really, do you want your kids to know their grandparents? You don't want that? Well, you better choose wisely when you're dating, and you better make sure that it all comes together. And the other thing I would say to you people who are single is forget your list. You know what I'm saying? Y'all got a list. Oh, he's going to be six foot two, and he's going to have dark hair, and he's going to wear a suit to work every day, and he's going to like polo or whatever, right? Oh, she's going to be beautiful. She's going to, you got your list. She's going to be an artist on this side, but she'll have a good job where she can make money anyway. She's going to, right, you have your list. You have all the things you want in that other person, right? And all the things you're looking for. And ironically, what's weird is sometimes you single people don't realize this. We didn't know it either. Our list is often ourselves and the other gender. What we mean is, I want her to like all the things I like. I want him to love what I love. I want him to do what I do. I want him to have my hobbies with me. I want her to like the books I like and the movies I like. It's like, well, if you just want yourself, you're a narcissist, right? Maybe, maybe you aren't that great. And maybe what you need is not your list, but God's list. And God's list is, oh, you're horrible over here, so I got someone who's the polar opposite. I'll fix that in you. You got this problem, he's got this strength. Uh, you got this issue you're really strong about, but she's got this thing over here. So he's going to put you together with somebody who's very opposite from you. And the marriages that work really well are like that. Can you imagine what it's like the first couple of years of marriage when you wake up every morning with someone who's your opposite? You think it's smooth and easy? <laughs> no. No. Why? Because you now have to become something different if you're going to live a lifetime with that person. And it's going to be work on you. So forget your list. Let God put a list together for you. Because what God does is, and I think Jesus referred to it you know, when he says that Adam and Eve puts them together, he takes the two and he makes them into one that is stronger and bigger and more complete, like fully human. All that masculinity that's healthy and all that femininity that's healthy, he puts together and says, oh, this is what humanity really looks like when it's in rhythm together. 
That's really the truth. So here we are in this room, all of us with our issues. You've been divorced. You've been the child of divorce. You've had families that have been divorced. You're, you're married now in an unhappy marriage. You're happily married, but you're not quite sure what to do. I think it'd be healthy if we maybe just stood and prayed because I will say this. There, whatever status we're in right now, this is our starting point today. I can't go back in time and undo stuff I did. You can't go back in time and undo lost years. You can't go backwards. That's not the way the whole universe works. The way the universe works is you have this day to start. And you start this day and you move forward. And you say, from this day forward, Jesus, I'm going to work with you and you can undo my past by giving me a new future. And his way of undoing your past is to say, good, I'm going to unravel some stuff in you and you've got to let him do it. And so for all of us, I want to sit back and say, we all ought to just pray, say, Lord, I just need to commit to you my future. If you're in a great marriage, it could die. Things could happen that were going wrong. So you always need to be protective of it. If you're in a bad marriage, God can fix it. If you've been divorced, it is possible to reconcile it. For some of you, for others of you, you've got to reconcile what you can and pay the price to do it. And if you're single, you're like, Lord, I want to do it right, which means probably not my way, but your way. So why don't we stand and let's just pray a surrender kind of prayer to God right now. Oh, Lord. Lord, I don't even know quite how to pray all this because you know the intricate, the intricate things with each person in the room today. You're an omnipresent God, so you have been there every step of everyone's life in this room. There's never been a conversation we've had or a moment we've been through where you were not there watching and observing, where you were not participating in our lives. Every single one of us, you know our stories intimately. You even remember stuff about our lives that we don't remember anymore. We stand here right now saying, Lord, this is my starting point. I cannot go backwards, but I can only go forward. And so to make this a new starting point, Lord, I say, please forgive me of my sins that I have committed that have violated your word, violated the sanctity of your love, where I have wounded and harmed others out of my own greed, maybe selfishness, where I was after my way and my will, and as a consequence, I hurt so many others. Forgive me of that. Forgive me of that sin and cover it by your shed blood. And Lord, the wounds that have been placed in me from others, Lord, I just want to have those released through my forgiveness going back out again. And then, Lord, may this be a fresh starting point. Make me what it is you want me to be. Shape me into the person that you want me to be. Help me, Lord, to see the sacrifices I need to make. Help me, Lord, that I can have the courage to face myself and realize maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. And then to understand I can lay back in your love and know that you will try to change. That's right. You will change with my participation. Those things about me that are harmful to myself and others. And Lord, give me a new future, a bright future, where you can take the sins of the past that I have done and I could proclaim them in the future and they would be something that is glorious that saves other people from those same harms, those same wounds, that same damage. Make me strong, Lord. Make me strong in you. And I pray, Lord, for the loves that are in this room, the people who are sharing their lives with one another in love, commitment, the difficulty it is that there's an enemy out there who wants to rip and tear and wound it. And Lord, I pray for their protection. I pray that your spirit would be in their lives and in their hearts. And I'd pray that you would knit them with a new sense of joy for the person they're with. These things I ask in your holy name. Amen. All right. Thanks for enduring the hard hitting kind of stuff. God bless you guys.